Hello, everyone. Good afternoon, and welcome to the inaugural lecture of the Conversations Lecture Series, powered by all graduates. The inaugural lecture will be presented by Dr. Erika Gonzalez Garcia today, uh, OZIT National President, and the presentation is titled Cohesion and Belonging the role of the National Professional Association in the Australian TNI landscape. Before we start, I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land on which we gather today and pay my respects to their elders past and present. I extend that respect to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples here today. Conversations Lectures is an international talk series hosted by the All Graduates Training Division, Conversations Interpreting and Translating. The series invites TNI academics, students, and practitioners, TNI technology companies, and other researchers and professionals who work in the culturally and linguistically diverse sector to discuss their research and their works. Each lecture will feature a special guest and will be held at our Melbourne training facilities, which we are hearing today, as well as streamed live online via our YouTube channel. Now, we also have the next two lectures uh, coming up too. So lecture two will be presented by Dr. Curtis Roman, who's a director of Aboriginal Interpreting Service in Northern Territory, as well as Lavinia Heffernan, who's the project officer for the Indigenous Interpreting Project. And um, they'll be talking about Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander interpreting in Australia. And lecture three will be presented by Associate Professor Mark Orlando, who's the director of translation interpreting program at Macquarie University. And um, his lecture will be titled The Dehumanization and Rehumanization of the Translation and Interpreting Professions. Before I go on for too much longer, I would like to now invite our CEO, Ismail Akinju, to come and say a few words and also present today's lecturer. Thank you, Kati. First of all, thank you, everybody, for uh, making the time to. Uh, come to our training facilities. Uh, it is a very unique opportunity these days to uh, have a live event uh, or in-person event. We are also uh, live streaming this event uh, across uh, Australia and uh, we do have some guests uh, overseas. It is my privilege today to uh, introduce and invite our very first speaker for our lecture series, Erica. Before I uh, do that. I'd just like to make a quick mention that uh, we are extremely proud to be involved in, I guess, bringing together the profession, uh, practitioners, stakeholders, uh, government uh, bodies, I guess, to be able to engage and share information to improve, I guess, standards as well as uh, professional practice across uh, Australia. So our uh, Conversations brand is really all about training, engaging, upskilling practitioners. I'd like to take the opportunity now to invite Erica. Erica is, uh, you would, uh, most of you would uh, know, is a senior lecturer at RMIT University here in uh, Melbourne. She is also a senior fellow of the Higher Education Academy in the UK. She is a practicing conference interpreter, as well as an advanced translator in the Spanish stream. Erica, it is my pleasure to invite you. The stage is yours. All right. Good afternoon, everyone. And thank you so much for coming and making the time to attend this webinar. It's a great pleasure for me to be with all of you today, but it's uh, even more special because I haven't seen some of you for a long time. Um, I haven't seen Fatih for over a year, I think, and I've been um, talking to all these uh, on numerous occasions remotely. Same with Emiliano and my colleague Miranda from RMIT is here as well. So it's great to see you all in the flesh and obviously uh, those who are at home I hope to be able to see you in our next face-to-face -face event um, just a few words for those in lockdown hang in there it'll come to the time where we can be all together in a national conference so when uh, Fatih asked me to talk about OSIT or the um, Australian um, Institute of Interpreters and Translators I thought about the angle of the presentation and I thought 
about myself and what uh, OSIT meant for me as Erica when I first came to Australia as a practitioner. And to me, it was um, not just an association, but it was a, a platform for belonging and cohesion. Um, as you know, translators and interpreters, many of us are freelancers. We go to court, we go to hospitals, but we do not enjoy a common space unless you are obviously working at a major hospital uh, full time. We usually don't have a, a platform where we share experiences, where we learn about the profession and OSIT did that for me. They provided me a professional family, but also some very good friendships at a personal level. So for me, OSIT basically is part of my journey in Australia as well. So um, OSIT stands for the Australian Institute of Interpreters and Translators. And this is who we are. So as you can see, very colorful bunch of people with different age groups from students to senior practitioners. And uh, basically we covered the broad array of languages. And um, this was a photo taking in Hobart in our last face-to-face -face conference, which was held in November, October, 2019. So basically we are translators and interpreters working in Australia. We also have some members overseas, but who have ties, obviously professional ties to Australia. So first of all, I'll start by giving a little, um, you know, um, update of what OCT is, our, uh, the background information about the organization. And as I said before, we are the National Association for the Translating and Interpreting Profession. As such, we provide a voice, translators and interpreters practicing in Australia. But we also have strong international connections and OSIT is a member of FIT, which is the International Federation of Translators. It's a huge federation which is made of um, translation and interpreting associations all over the world. So through FIT also, we get information and connections to other countries all over the world in the five continents and through the journal that FIT publishes, Translation, which we also obviously distribute for free among our membership, we get to know about what other colleagues around the world are doing. And obviously, we also have access to professional development that it's not just delivered in Australia, but um, all over the world. What's our mission? So as a professional association, obviously, we stand for ethical, competent, and informed practice. And to do that, we promote our code of ethics. Um, if you go to our website, you can download the code of ethics for free. And actually some uh, colleagues have also translated that code of ethics into different languages. We organize quality professional development, and we also work with uh, language service providers, private and public institutions. We cooperate also with NATI, the National Accreditation Authority for Translators and Interpreters. And um, we, that way, um, are able to deliver high quality PD um, on many occasions for free or at very reasonable prices for our members. We're also endorsing research, and I'll talk about that a bit more, but we believe that in order to raise the bar of our profession, we also have to conduct research and support educational organizations like our affiliate universities to conduct research that um, is going to be positive for the advancement of our profession. And obviously, we support adequate remuneration and working conditions for our members. So it's a members association. When people say OSIT does this or that, well, OSIT is all of us. OSIT is one and every single member that belongs to the organization. At the moment, uh, we've just recently gone through a milestone because uh, we've just achieved more than 2,000 members. So it means a great organization with more than 2,000 colleagues you can reach out. And uh, that makes us a huge family, as you can see. And the more we are, the stronger we are, the better we can make a point in regards to quality translating and interpreting service delivery. Um, our membership has been steadily growing each year. At the beginning, it was a small association, but now, as I said, we're very proud to say that we're over 2,000 members. Uh, 
we're not a union. Um, that's uh, a different um, organization, Professionals Australia, but obviously we seek to build productive relationships with union organizations such as Professionals Australia, because we want that organizations engage professional translators and interpreters, people with their due certifications, and then that they are remunerated accordingly. Um, we are not a translating and interpreting agency or a language service provider, but we do maintain a register of member practitioners. And we also like, um, in this instance, we cooperate with language service providers, especially the ethical ones who um, support our membership, support initiatives like this one, and work with us so that we can provide the best possible service to uh, communities who are not fluent in the um, official language of Australia, mainly English in this case. Um, we also keep abreast of what's happening in the industry at national and international level. As I said, we are part of FIT, the International Federation of Translators, and through them we also learn what's happening in other parts of the world. Um, we also have a monthly newsletter and I think this is really important because sometimes, as I said, you go to your appointments, you go to court, you go to hospital, you might go to a police station, you are doing your job. But as I said, we don't have like the teachers, they go to the staff room where they sit together and they share a cup of tea. We don't have that. Many of us don't have that. So our monthly newsletters are a way to uh, learn what's happening in the profession, what's happening with research, what are the decisions which are being made that affect us? What are the PD events that are being offered at national level, um, et cetera, et cetera. So it's a great way to find out what's going on in the profession. And we provide the professional platform for translating and interpreting uh, um, practitioners. So basically it's, we are a cohesive platform that we provide a sense of belonging, belonging to a profession. Um, and I feel very proud to be an OSITA because as I said, at a personal level, it brought me many friendships. And some of my closest friends in Australia who are like family are OSIT members. And also um, they maybe belong to a broader um, array a range of colleagues who I can reach out when you know clients call you, you cannot do a job or they ask for a language that you do not cover, you can always go to your colleagues. So I'll talk about the structure a little bit. So um, OCT is a volunteer organization. So all of us, myself, Miranda, who is the national secretary, and all the colleagues you will see later, we are all volunteers. So we don't get remunerated for what we do, but we do have, especially now because it's over 2000 members, a very well structured organization with many policies. And I have to say that in the last couple of years, because we've grown so much, we've also created some paid positions for um, members um, of the association. So the professional development coordinator, the office administrators, these are all paid positions. And we're very proud to be able to offer also jobs and work to our own members. Um, as I said, we've grown hugely in the last couple of years. I joined in 2012 and basically it's nearly a different organization from when I, I joined. So we had to develop policies. Things would you know, come up and we were like, oh, we need a policy for this. So we'd have to draft a policy. Then it gets approved by the National Council. And then it is passed um, as, you know, as part of the policies of the organization. Um, we had to also streamline the work we do. There's huge administrative work. So that's why the more we are, the better, because then we can get support and help for um, you know, managing the organization efficiently. Um, OCT is governed by a national council, so the national council members are volunteers as well, and they are voted every year in the national um, annual general meeting. So um, we've got six members in the national executive and a delegate for each OCT local branch. So I thought nothing like I can give you all these titles, but I thought I would show you the people behind the organization. So that's me. It's funny because I did the presentation and um, I had everyone but myself. So I thought, oh, I better put a little picture of me as well. So that's, we have a national president and three vice presidents. 
Um, one is for events and professional development, and that's Despina. Despina is a full-time interpreter of the ENT hospital here in Melbourne. Um, then we've got the vice president for communications and public relations. This was also a new opposition as we grew as well. And Susan is a Hungarian translator based in South Australia. Then we've got Said. This is the latest addition to our organization. This was just I mean, a couple of months ago. Yes, we added the third vice president to do with ethics and professional practice. Our work uh, lobbying with the government has increased, especially in pandemic times. We've got, obviously, because we've got more members, more issues arise in terms of ethical dilemmas. So we've created um, a third portfolio, if you like, for ethics and professional practice, which is led by Said Koshrabi. Said uh, was based in Tasmania and recently has moved to Melbourne, a Persian a Farsi interpreter and translator. And um, Said and his colleagues in Tasmania were fundamental to um, set up the Tasmania branch before they de um, depended on Victoria. Victoria and Tasmania were united. But again, because it's growing, Tasmania sought independence. They were successful in their bid for independence. And we've got a brand new branch in Tasmania. We've got our national secretary, Dr. Miranda Lai, the national treasurer, Han Shu. Miranda Lai also works at RMIT with me. Han Shu newly graduated with a PhD at the University of New South Wales. And uh, the immediate past president is Professor Sandra Hale, who many of you possibly know. She is also an academic at the University of New South Wales. So as you can see, really good mixture between full-time practitioners, freelancers, and academics in the National Council. And I think this is great because we all come from different backgrounds and just getting all these people together. Um, I think I'm very proud of this National Council not just for the, because of the variety of people we have, because of their passion, their dedication and diligence. Um, I don't think I could be able to do my job without this amazing bunch of people working together. Uh, and this is one of the things that have always attracted me to Aussie, the selfless dedication to the profession by those who are really volunteering. Um, what do we get? Because some people, they ask me, it's like, what do you get? Well, a good which is well done, uh, advocating for the rights of my colleagues, for a better profession. And I have to say, all of us who are sitting here today um, have contributed somehow to make Australia one of the leading countries in the provision of um, community translating and interpreting. I, I know we've got our own issues and we can sort that out among ourselves. But if you look at the world scenario, the world scene, we are at the forefront of translating and interpreting service delivery at community level. And this is something very, um, we should feel very proud about. So as I said, we've got the National Council, those people in the pictures, in the slides before, but then we've got branch delegations. So in each state and territory across Australia, we've got branches. And we've got the Queensland, ACT, Victoria, Tasmania, New South Wales, Northern Territory and South Australia still work together and Western Australia. So um, each branch has a set of volunteer delegates and they organize their own um, events, professional development, et cetera. Um, and then every now and then we also gather together as I'll explain. So we've got this. Um, the branches that operate in each state and territory, but then we also have committees. Committees are synonym to working groups, right? So we've got committees to oversee specific uh, aspects of OSIT's work on behalf of the National Council, as I said. Since we've grown so much, we had to create these working groups because each of them takes care of different aspects of the profession and the organization. So we've got an education committee, which um, deals with all the affiliate uh, educational institutions, universities and TAFEs and RTOs, um, and also engages the new generation. So basically, they are the ones who look after our future colleagues, the future generations, which will be admit, who will be admitted to the profession. We've got a communications committee, very important in terms of 
um, raising awareness about translating and interpreting, but especially raising awareness about high quality, important of engaging um, duly certified professionals, et cetera, et cetera. We've got a professional development committee. They work really hard. Those are the ones who basically organize every single professional event uh, we um, organize within OSIT. And we've got a new ethics and professional practice committee. So this committee looks after things like, for example, drafting position papers, when we need to engage as stakeholders about issues that affect our profession, the Ethics and Professional Practice Committee drafts guidelines. Um, for example, lately they have drafted the protocols for community translation, and we've been disseminating those um, protocols among language service providers like all graduates. We compiled and collated all their feedback and then we will put it all in a master document that we will be able to distribute broadly among different stakeholders. Um, we also communicate with government bodies when, for example, pandemic, not very nice translations. Oops, we need to raise the alarm. Why are these translations not great? So the Ethics and Professional Practice Committee deals with that. But also it deals with grievances among members, and we've had a few. Um, you know, as in any other profession, issues might arise between two interpreters. Uh, they might be, uh, sometimes people do not behave ethically. So these matters are referred to us, and in a collaborate, collaborative, constructive manner, we try to uh, provide advice to our colleagues and usually try to sort out any you know, uh, disagreement in a nice um, manner. So, and then we've got the National Conference Organizing Committee. Um, this is our big event where everyone gathers at once in one location. It usually rotates. So we had 2018, we all went to Adelaide. 2019, it was Hobart. Last year, it was at home in our pajamas in from our home offices. And hopefully, hopefully this year, fingers crossed, we will be going to Perth, Fremantle, or Scarborough, actually, um, to have our um, national conference. So there's also a committee for that. They look after the abstracts of the presentations. They look after the keynote speakers. They organize travel for the keynote speakers. They organize catering. So if any of you at home want to join, want to um, give, just join one of your local branches, committees, join us it first, obviously. And as you can see, there's plenty to do to ev for everyone. So what do we do? Um, this is the Queensland branch, actually. So uh, the Code of Ethics, as you know, our profession is regulated by a Code of Ethics, and we promote ethical and professional practice. Our Code of Ethics provides roadmap for practitioners. Um, we need to undertake and stick to the Code of Ethics, and we promote also increased understanding of and adherence to the Code by facilitating professional development on the Code for practitioners. But more and more, we are also uh, working like with NATI, for example, language service providers, to um, work with those who work with interpreters so that they know how to work with us. So that's also on our to-do list to engage more and more those who work with us so that um, we work in a cooperative and efficient manner. And then, as I said before, we've got that ethics and professional practice committee as well. So if you ever have an issue with a colleague or you think that there's been a grievance, you can always write to us and we've got a committee who will uh, put their thinking caps on and try to resolve the matter in a constructive way. Um, one of the big things we do is professional development. Um, so we have a deep commitment to enhancing professional status of our members. So when people say, and I know that many of you have been practicing for many years, and when I've been delivering professional development courses, I Every now and then I found a bit of resistance. I've been interpreting for 20 years. What is this woman who is like so much younger gonna teach me? 
And well, they've got a point because that's why we get together because I'm sure that I can learn from you and you can learn from me. Because when you get a room full of 20 people who, with different types of experiences, we can learn from each other so much. And to me, learning is something continuous. It doesn't matter if you're a parent, a professional, a member of your you know, a religious or community group, there's always something to learn in these different roles you fulfill in life. So more at work. I always say I've got a disease and I'm, um, I need to take medication because I had um, an illness and I need to have tablets for the rest of my life. So I always think if my doctor wouldn't do professional development, wouldn't um, read research, Possibly he would be prescribing me the same pills he would prescribe to my great grandmother 20 years ago, right? But because my doctor is great, he does PD, he goes to conferences, he does presentations at conferences, uh, I know that I get up to date medication for my condition because I've got a doctor who does PD. So it's as simple as that. The teachers, um, accountants, uh, doctors, everybody does PD. And um, people sometimes say the system is um, not inclusive, it's expensive. These days, there is no excuse. There's so much free PD um, delivered by OSIT, by NATSI, language service provider. So really, there's not an excuse. And even if you are the most experienced translator or interpreter, there's always something, something you will learn. It's happened to me that sometimes you go to a PD session and it's like, oh, maybe it's a bit basic, but there's always something that you get. There's always something that you can take on board. So even if you know there's a face-to-face -face event, even for the sake of catching up with your colleagues and then going for a cup of tea. So we put lots of emphasis, as I said, in the need of continuous professional development because we believe that quality is also strictly related to how good you are in improving your 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 credential improving your practice and learning as you go as i said we offer a broad range of high quality pd um, and as an example for example we collaborated with nati and nati funded a professional um, development event that was based on the recommended national standards for interpreters working in courts and tribunals if you are not aware of that document, you can download it, it's free. So we got two professionals to go through these standards. Then there was a little quiz. So people uh, now, those who have done the course, know that when they go to court and they say, you have to interpret for such and such court, and you say, I need a bit of briefing, you know that in those standards, it is said that you can actually request briefing and it's your right to request briefing or request a break or, you know, so this is a little booklet which contains rights for you as interpreters working in courts and tribunals. But obviously it's quite dense, the document. So we prepare the professional development event to kind of, you know, um, deliver it in a nice and enjoyable manner. And um, you can actually download it for free from our learning platform. So we've got a learning platform. Um, so you join for a course and then you get access to the learning platform and then you can download all the materials, study them on your own time. And we also have a professional development forum. This is what it looks like. So we've got general discussions, PD, education and research, legal translating and interpreting. We've got one for early career and students, for interpreters, researchers, translators, and the language specific. So recently, um, I was translating a piece of literature from a um, South African author into Spanish for an academic volume. And they were talking about a type of shoes. And I had a look at it and it's a South African brand of shoes. And I was like, and how do I translate this into Spanish? So I put it in the forum and a few colleagues wrote, it's like, um, so what's the aim of this translation? It's literature. So the scopus, you don't need to be, what's the aim of that sentence? The type of shoes she was wearing or that was just a detail you can omit. So I had like about 10 responses from colleagues 
And then I contacted the author and the author said, this is what I meant. So I put it in the forum and among all of us, we decided what the best translation was for that. Or people sometimes um, post in the legal forum, for example, the French uh, interpreters have been building their own um, legal glossary. So they put uh, an announcement there, I think. They wrote, look, there's a working group going on. Who wants to join? French translators also, for example, have uh, created a translation masterclass. So they translate something all together, then they attend the session and basically they go through each other's translations, um, analyze the um, aim, scopus of the translation or what the goal it is. They have a look at how each other have translated it and they learn, as I said, as a group. So. This is also something um, that we offer to our membership. So we, we organize events, including conferences, workshops, webinars, but also networking events. In the ACT last week, for example, they had a trivia night. Um, every now and then we do picnics in the park or we go for walks, as I said, teachers, I don't know, doctors, bankers, lawyers, um, accountants who work in a firm, they have a staff room they share time together all the time they might go you know together for drinks after work on a friday we don't have that so this is a way for us to connect with our colleagues um as i said we employ a national pd officer to liaise with branches to elaborate a pd calendar for the year and we usually offer uh, PD very regularly on a monthly basis in each state and territory. And then education. Uh, because I'm an educator as well, I always try to see my students as my future colleagues. And I think we need to look after the uh, future generation and uh, we need to welcome them in the profession. And that's why we also have a very strong um, education committee. So many of you will be, you will be very experienced translators and interpreters. So you can actually join and be mentors for younger um, colleagues. So um, we've got affiliation with educational institutions to forge closer links between the education sector and the profession. Because, you know, you might be in a classroom and you might be the best student, but when you really go and work out there, it's a shock to the system. And I remember myself um, trained in Europe, mainly in conference interpreting, and the first assignment I had in court, I was scarred for days. It was um, a migrant who had been um, intercepted trying to cross the border from Spain to France. This girl had could not speak Spanish. She'd been the victim of human trafficking. And as she was telling her story, I could just for days not even sleep. At that time when I was working in Spain as well, same, um, there were lots of people coming from uh, sub-Saharan Africa. And it was when we had the, the uh, war in Sierra Leone. So everybody would say that they were from Sierra Leone, but many of them were Okay, so we'll go back to the translation competition. So usually every year we choose several languages and the students have to translate from that language into English or into load, but also uh, members can actually be members of the panel or the tribunal who actually assesses those translations. So the assessors or the panel uh, also has a PD point, can claim PD point for participating as members of the panel. And they also have um, free, Miranda is it free um, um, registration to the national conference, isn't it? The, yes. And this year, I have to say, everyone has done really well, but Western Sydney Uni got most of the awards this year. So congratulations to all the successful students this year. So as I said, the annual conference is the highlight. I definitely really like this one because you see colleagues, I was living in New South Wales before. So going to this conference is actually the opportunity to catch up with everyone and see um, those colleagues who usually you see over Skype or Teams or Zoom. So the national conference is a forum where a broad range of professionals like industry practitioners, any of you, uh, linguists, academics, agency owners, project managers, trainers, and others discuss issues pertinent to translating and interpreting. And I have to say last year, possibly because it was online, 
we have started getting international presence in our conferences. I have to say that the quality of the conference, despite it being online, it was great. I was very um, positively impressed by the work that the organizing committee did because it was online. We followed it at home, but actually it ran really smoothly. So it's an exciting event where new ideas are generated, disciplinary boundaries are crossed, and knowledge about research and practice is shared. And what I most enjoy about it are the coffee breaks and dinner, obviously, as I said, because it's the time you have to really mingle with colleagues. This year, we don't know what's going to happen. So hopefully, some of us will be able to go to Perth, but if not, we are thinking of delivering it in the hybrid mode. So um, also we know that some people um, due to the pandemic have faced um, financial hardship. Some of the jobs they were doing um, had to be cut. So we thought that organizing it in a hybrid manner would allow people to go if they want, but also to follow it at home if that's not convenient for them. And I think it's the way to go in the future, like this event. We've got people on site, but we've got um, quite a few following the event from home. Advocacy and solidarity. So as I said, we our main goal is to raise the standards of the profession. I think that that conception that we had before, OK, I speak two languages. I can be a translator and interpreter. I think that's changing. And we work a lot to change perceptions. As I said, no one would go to a doctor or probably a lawyer who haven't gone to university or who have done some minimum training. And I think we should be considered also professionals who apply a science, translating and interpreting science. So we use all forms of media to promote issues of importance to practitioners. We also build a sense of community among practitioners through a variety of channels, including emails, social media posts. So um, a couple of years ago, we engaged a communications officer. So our communications officer looks after social media, um, also drafts all the LinkedIn posts, et cetera, et cetera. So by doing this, obviously, we want to raise the visibility of translating and interpreting in the society. One of the things we did also, there is an organization in Europe called Red Tea. And basically, they look after interpreters who have worked in war zones. So OSIT was signatory of the letter that was sent to Scott Morrison to bring Afghan interpreters to Australia, Afghan interpreters who had worked for our defense forces. So I read that recently they've landed in Australia. And so uh, yesterday I got a message from one of our members uh, and it was a petition for the ethics and professional um, issues committee saying, why don't we welcome them? So it's something that I want to put to the national council. I haven't even told my national council about it, but I thought, why don't we welcome them? Why don't we? Um, you know, let them explore OSIT. And this um, member was saying, actually, I would be happy to, you know, set up some sort of social gathering to welcome them wherever they are in Australia. So that's another thing. As I said, we collaborate with international organizations for uh, raising not just the profile, but also advocating for the rights of uh, our fellow colleagues. We also have a quarterly magazine, In Touch. It's our official magazine. It's published three times a year and showcase practitioner achievements. It's an analysis of current issues. For example, in this picture here, these two ladies in the balcony in the theater are two of our Oslan members. So they are basically doing sign language interpreting of a theater performance or a play. So, um, and this is not an academic journal. This is a journal written for practitioners. Sometimes there are academic um, you know, articles, but it's mainly about us, about our fellow colleagues. We always feature some of our colleagues at the very end where they tell us how they started, how they got uh, certified, et cetera, et cetera. And it's actually a really nice read. Um, Future growth. So as a big organization these days, we have to do things like a strategic plans because we're so big that it's like, okay, what are we going to do? So we need to actually draft and figure out what we want to do. So our idea is to offer specialized PD, better spread across branches, 
uh, before um, one of the issues was that in states that are smaller, um, in interpreters, translators who work in remote or regional areas wouldn't have access to good PD, or they had to spend money to come to Melbourne, Sydney, sometimes they spend money commuting, staying maybe for the night. The pandemic, it's been horrible, but it's also brought some positives. Like, for example, now um, we can promote more equity because this event, we are here in Melbourne, but someone in a little town in regional Victoria in Shepparton, uh, not that Shepparton's little, but they could still follow this event in the comfort of their home. Um, we also identify gaps in training at educational institutions. Educational institutions, we are tied up by, you know, administrative procedures and there's so much we can do. Sometimes, as you very well know, we can only cater for the most I would say mainstream languages. What happens to interpreters of new and emerging languages or those people who cannot even access tertiary level of education, even at vocational level? So that's where OSIT comes in and can fill in those gaps that um, uh, universities or TAFEs cannot fill. Improve working conditions for practitioners. For example, at the moment, we're working um, on a petition to ask the courts that we can use hearing loops, for example, to do interpreting so that we don't need to be whispering in the ear of the defendant in this COVID area. So that would allow us to have, you know, um, safety and uh, have a social distancing in place without jeopardizing the quality of the work we do. So um, there are some members of ours who actually work also very close with the judiciary, like Professor Sandra Hale. And one of the things is that to raise awareness on uh, the kind of work we do and um, work with other professions to see how we can improve this. We developed, as we said, the um, national standards for working with um, interpreters in courts and tribunals. OSI was involved. It wasn't just OSI, it was also members of the judiciary, academics, uh, people from uh, Aboriginal interpreter services. So it was a huge bunch of people, and OSI has been promoting them. We also did the same. We developed also a guideline for working with clinicians. Uh, we also want to attract new members, especially our indigenous interpreters and translators who play such a fundamental role in their communities. Nati is working also really hard in developing professional development, uh, fostering um, certification, and we're gonna start collaborating with Nati to offer PD also to our indigenous colleagues. We want to diversify funding, and I said this is the volunteer organization. How do we operate? well with the money or that you know it's paid through membership fees and uh professional development so we are a non-for-profit organization so whatever we did it gets invested in the membership in free pd events or in um making the the work of the volunteers a bit easy as i said by um, engaging uh, a pd coordinator who gets uh, paid for that etc and as i said on a few occasions we want to increase the visibility of the profession in the society um what are the current projects because it's all very good to say what we do but i always like to provide evidence and tangible um, examples so um we are working with NARI in a project that is the National Aging Research um, Institute, and they've got a project called Mindset, and all graduates actually is also involved in that project, and it's to train interpreters who will be working with clinicians to uh, detect dementia or with dementia patients. We're also collaborating with the University of New South Wales in an Australia Research Council research on how the judiciary communicates with interpreters. Obviously, uh, the more they know about us, they'll communicate in a way that it's easier for us. So this is analyzing how they communicate with interpreters. And then NEDA, um, which is exploring also disability and the use of interpreting services in that area. So we also have advisory groups and advocacy. For example, I participate on behalf of OSIT at the CALD COVID Communications Advisory Group, which is set up by the federal government in Canberra. So I attend monthly meetings and one of my 
big uh, jobs in that advisory group has been to raise awareness about the quality of the translations. Because they say usually, oh, we get Nati certified translators there, and you look at some of the most popular languages and you go, hmm, maybe we need to review this. Or would, and it's like, no, not everyone is certified because for certain languages, we don't have certification. What do we do with those translators? So we want to raise awareness so that we can provide training for those translators who never had the chance possibly to get formal education. We also work with the Victorian Law Reform Commission, which is looking at introducing uh, interpreters so that they can have deaf jurors and it's a matter of equity again, why up until now deaf people could not participate as jurors because they were not interpreters. So they are looking into reforming the law so that we can have deaf jurors as well. We also work with the Victorian Department of Premier and Cabinet in the Translation Task Force again, raising awareness about quality. Um, we've also been working with Queensland Health about the use of uncertified interpreters and again collaborating with NATI and local doctors there to promote the training of uh, more interpreters in, in Queensland. Um, introduction of remote interpreting technology in court. So, Keep um, tuned because we're going to launch a change.org petition um, about interpreting in courts and the introduction of technology that will allow for uh, remote simultaneous interpreting, or at least um, that the interpreter doesn't need to be whispering in the defendant's ear. And we are also uh, launching, as I said, the professional development course that was funded by NATI, recommending national standards for working with interpreters in courts and tribunals. So as you can see, we're very busy. Um, so that was all. Um, I don't know if there are any questions. I'll be more than happy to take questions from colleagues um, on the ground here today or online. Sure. So basically, um, community translation, obviously, it's been around for a while, but I think the pandemic really um, highlighted the need to have a quality assurance framework. So we got uh, people from OSIT who are translators um, and also people who've been working in uh, the community translation academic field. So we've got Mustafa Taibi also from Western Sydney Uni, who is um, a colleague of Uldis. And basically they drafted some protocols or um, guidelines for the, um, for tr community translation. So at the moment, we need to collate uh, all the responses we have received from government and language service providers, because we drafted them, but obviously we wanted to also the input of those who are gonna implement them or those who actually outsource their work to translators. So now at the moment, we've um, received all the responses from stakeholders and we are in the process of putting it all together so that it can be distributed nationally. So it's not available as yet? Not as yet. It's still in draft process. And as I said, because we volunteers, obviously we have to just go, you know, whenever people are available to meet and work on that, but it's gonna happen in the next three months because it has to, but uh, they will be made public and obviously we will organize a launch and we'll make big noise about it. So yeah, and it's been great because uh, it also shows how important it is to refer to research that has been done in that area. Um, from Australia, they lead the international group for research in community translation. So we've also been getting input from research to apply to these protocols but also we wanted to hear what happens on the ground because sometimes that's the thing research and theory is great but we thought it was really important to hear from those who are on the ground administering these translations and we also wanted to get feedback from the practical side of it 
Yes, that's a very good question. For those who couldn't hear it, Uldis was saying that usually language service providers are the party which gets ignored uh, because sometimes, you know, relationships between practitioners and language service providers have not been maybe the best, but obviously they play an important role. And there's another association like OSIF, but which is for uh, language service providers, which is the AELC. Look, um, what we believe as an association is that we need to work together. They would not exist if we don't exist. And in many cases, we wouldn't exist if the language service providers were not there. So um, obviously there are huge differences between some providers and others, but we're happy to work with those who um, like all graduates today have organized an event, develop and offer their own PD, support their translators and interpreters, and also support research. So in this game, we are all together. And I think, we cannot fight each other. We need to find, obviously, we've got different interests, but on many occasions we've got the same interests. So we need to work collaboratively together to reach better outcomes. So one of the things I haven't mentioned in my presentation, because it's something we are working on, is that we would like to have a new membership category for language service providers. So we want to invite language service providers to be part of OSIT. Because as I said, at the end of the day, we are all, you know, a big profession. So we would like to admit language service providers who abide by certain conditions like, you know, offering support to their translators and interpreters, um, uh, language service providers who observe the code of ethics, language service providers who remunerate their translators and interpreters decently. So um, we are working towards that and we want to create also a code of ethics that they can observe. I know that the ALC has a code of ethics, but I think we are at the juncture where our own code of ethics has to be updated. It's been 2012 was the last time that was updated. I think we're getting to that point when we may need a little review and possibly many of you will be invited to join and, and have a say and the same for language service providers. So with this pretty much, yes, we are open to work uh, collaboratively with um, language service providers. Yeah. Thank you for the question. Dr. Uldis, a um, couple of questions here is, uh, one's from Joanna T. Can Ozit please check and update the education section and the free webinar section on their website? Sometimes the education information is out of date or the free webinars are broken links. Thank you. Oh, okay. Usually now we've got, that's why we've got the learn book. We've got the learning platform and that's why also um, we have a more powerful tool to do all these things. Also bear in mind that if you've got any feedback, let us know. As I said, many of us are volunteers and sometimes it's not like in a company that you've got someone looking after these things 24 seven. So that's why um, if you've got any feedback, if something is not working, just let us know and we will fix it at the earliest convenience. Obviously these are very interesting uh, uh, pieces of feedback that we would definitely um, look into. Yeah. Um, just a few more comments, Erica. Uh, I think these webinars work really well. Appreciate the efforts. Um, also, one about the potential hybrid conference. A great idea that the conference will be online as well as in person for people who live locally. Yep. So I think we're all looking forward to that. Um, and a great presentation. Thank you very much from Magdalena Mello. Good idea to have language service providers to get involved. Yep. Excellent. Well, thank you very much. And thank you those at home. Thank you those here. And as I said, uh, I'm very passionate about what we do. And remember that every one of us fulfills a massive role in multicultural and multilingual Australia. So keep up with a great um, job. And hopefully we'll see you at the next webinar or face-to-face -face event or at the next uh, OSIT online forum in our learning platform. Thank you very much to Dr. Erica. Um, and thank you all for coming and joining us today for our inaugural conversations and lectures in these series. Uh, so we really, really appreciate you coming out. And those of you at home or at work, wherever you're watching, thank you so much for logging in today. Um, please make sure to subscribe to our page, our YouTube page, uh, our YouTube channel, um, so that you can see the upcoming uh, lectures as well. Um, so, 
the other two that are upcoming um, the next month. So we have one uh, lecture two is going to be presented by uh, in support with Nati. Um, and that will be the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander interpreting in Australia. And it will focus on the interpreting uh, Indigenous interpreting project, uh, which I think is a Nati initiative. Um, and that will be presented by Dr. Curtis Roman, the director of Aboriginal interpreting service in the Northern Territory, as well as Lavinia Heffernan, who is the project officer at Nati for the Indigenous interpreting project. So very looking forward to that very much. Um, that's on the Thursday, 29th of July. Uh, three till four o'clock. Okay, so if you're in Melbourne, hopefully uh, restrictions uh, lifting in Northern Territory, um, they'll be flying out here and coming here in person. Okay, so it'll be an honour and a great privilege to meet them here in person. Hopefully, um, this thing will. I know we. I know in Melbourne that um, we're almost unfortunately used to it by now, um, but I think it's the first time that they're going into lockdown over there. All I can say is just hang in there. It doesn't last forever. Um, and hopefully we can see you here in person. Um, and then in uh, August, 26th of August, Thursday, we'll have Associate Professor Mark Orlando, the Director of the Translation and Interpreting Program, Macquarie University. And he'll be speaking about the dehumanization and rehumanization of the translation and interpreting professions. Okay, so these are the next two lectures and please keep an eye out uh, on your emails as well as our YouTube channel um, for upcoming lectures as well. Uh, so there'll be more coming. Um, and uh, I, I think I can even say that some future presenters might already be sitting here as well. So um, hopefully we'll see them standing up here rather than sitting down there. Again, Dr. Erica Gonzalez, thank you so much for um, launching our conversations lecture series. You launched our podcast and uh, you're launching this for us as well. Um, so thank you again so much. It's always a pleasure being in the same room with you and I haven't seen you for so long as well. So thank you so much. And those of you at home, we'll hope to see you in the next live stream as well. Thank you and um, we'll see you next time.